Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I'm delighted to be your host and excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the 60th episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. Now, if you want to find out more about me, what the show is about, feel free to listen to previous episodes on my website, carolcoaching.com or the voiceamerica.com business channel. And be sure to download the app or you can tune in using your favorite podcast app. And if you missed last week's show, I interviewed a young writer, personal trainer, firefighter, Ironman athlete, and amateur evolutionary biologist, as well as my nephew, Carol, Colin Carroll. <laughs> I should get his name right. <laughs> He's going to be, no, Amy. Now, we talked about his recent published book, his recently published book, Fitness by Darwin, and why this approach to fitness will support you to be an even better leader. So be sure to check that out from, I think it's, it was uh, October 15th. And today, my guest is Shirley Dalton. Welcome, Shirley. Yeah, hi, Amy. I'm so excited to be here. I'm delighted to be talking with you today, too. Now, um, listeners, you might already detect from Shirley's accent that she comes from down under. So, Shirley, why don't you share a little bit more where you are today physically? <laughs> well, today I'm physically in Adelaide or a beach just south of in South Australia. And the rest of the country is pretty much in lockdown. So we're pretty lucky that we could still travel around and just wear a mask uh, if we're inside. But we've been traveling and working for about two and a half years now in our motorhome. So I could be anywhere. That is fantastic. <laughs> wow. Okay, great. So we may hear some uh, life in the um, trailer park that comes through <laughs> during the show. And I welcome any of that. So no, no worries. <laughs> So Shirley, let me tell the listeners a little bit more about, or a lot more about you, your background, and then we'll jump into some questions. Listeners, Shirley is a business and leadership expert, leader, speaker, and author. She's often described as having a strong business intuition, and she's formerly the COO for an Australian international franchise organization. And she's going to explain a little bit more about that. For 30, more than 30 years, actually, Shirley's been helping thousands of business owners and employees around the globe to release lifelong limiting beliefs. I'm hoping this uh, particular interviewer is hoping to shed one or two today. I can slip them in there. And also, she helps people put solid systems and procedures into place, as well as develop and improve their leadership skills. An expert in dealing with the headspace of leaders, managers, employees, and business owners, Shirley helps those stressed out professionals to create a coherent, smooth, running workplace or home life. And something that Shirley and I share, she was also created and hosted her own TV and radio show. Actually, I only did a radio show with Voice America, and she also worked with RHG Media. So, um, Shirley, I hope that you might have a few sh stories that you share from those past experiences as well. Absolutely. And before, you know, you and I are going to be talking a lot today about personality and how it affects the way people lead. Though before we do that, let's rewind a little bit more. And other than what I shared about your background, listen, share with the listeners uh, how you first came to do what you do. Sure. Yeah, I, I was the COO for the um, franchise company and a friend of mine who's a lawyer wanted me to help her type up some policies and procedures because she was worried about getting an audit. In the process of doing that, I loved it. Like I'm, I'm such, such a curious person and I like to get in and, and find out stuff. And um, before long, I had left the franchise organisation to start my own business, helping people to systemise their business. And we're not talking IT here. It was just you know, streamlining the organisations. When I would work with the smaller companies and finish the job, what I found was that the systems would fall over because the leaders and manage, managers didn't know how to lead and manage their ah. people or hold them accountable. So then I started coaching them. Then I did more leadership work for myself and then offered leadership programs. So now we had people and process. And then more recently, I've trained with David Bayer to become a transformational mindset coach. And now I help people with their mindset and their beliefs. So it's people, process and possibilities. But it's been this wow. evolution over the last 15, 16 years. 
people, process, and possibilities. Now that you've given the backstory, that those three words really um, have three dimension to them for me. And mm-hmm. so being a small business owner myself, I have already two questions for you about this. One is, what are some of the typical systems that people need help with? Where do they get stuck? And then the second question is, um, what was the second question? Okay, well, that one come back to me. Let's have you answer that question first. Yeah, it, it depends on where they're at in their journey. And it also depends on the particular area of their business. So I don't get into people's marketing and I don't get into their finance because I'm hopeless at both. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but people process and possibilities. So if, um, if they're looking at the customer journey, for example, mm. or if they've got um, some processes, like I work with a lot of real estate agencies. And once the agents go out and the person says, yes, please sell my house, then there's this whole back of house processing that needs to happen, you know, to organize the photos and the pest and building and get the mm-hmm. house ready for sale and then put that on. So I'm actually able to go in and help businesses to do that. And and a lot of them just struggle with that. What I found was that the the business owners, they're so clever, Amy. I've had the privilege of going into so many different businesses. They have an idea and then all of a sudden this business grows. It's very much like the e-myth. You know, they, they start out as the technician and yeah. then before long the business grows and then they have to put people on. But they don't know how to lead and manage them. And then yeah. eventually they get to become the business owner where, you know, as Gerber says, they're working on the business rather than in it. Right. Well, I help them. I help them progress through that journey because, you know, they're good at what they do. They Mm -hmm. might be making surfboards, make great surfboards, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to leading people or putting processes Mm -hmm. in for their business, not, Mm -hmm. not very. No, it's, it's, yeah, not where the passion is or the interest or the skill. Yeah. Okay. So then the second question is you said that once you set in the beginning, you would set that up for them. It was good to go, except it would fall over because they didn't have the leadership capacity. So what is one or two examples where their leadership needed an upgrade? Yeah, in terms of accountability, so what they can say, all right, now we've worked with Shirley and this is our new system because I'd, I'd act like a facilitator. What do you need? What do you need? And then, okay, what are we going to do? Are we having a meeting? Is that an email? So we would develop that. And then it seemed like as soon as I walked out the door, the system and the, the and owners, and, yeah, I just paid all this money <laughs> you're not doing it but they wouldn't have that conversation <laughs> then and so you know they would pay all that money and then the systems wouldn't work because the people wouldn't follow them and, and then I realized it's because they didn't know how to have those conversations yeah. so when you say they didn't know how to have those conversations difficult conversations with their employees Yes, very much like you have um, in your expertise, you know, how to have those difficult, delicate conversations where you have to give somebody the feedback that they're either not following the system or they're not performing according to our processes, basically going off and doing whatever they like. Mm. That's very difficult for people to come back as a leader and a manager and sit people down and say, this is not working and we need you to improve. Most people would rather run a mile than have that conversation. Plus, I think they see it as a burden and an extra and why can't it just this guy or gal just do their job when in fact that's part of the leader's role and I've had to accept that as well luckily that which I teach other people I'm having to practice myself so it keeps me in a place of of constantly having to polish my skills yes and also as a leader when you have people working with you you actually need to be more organized because they're waiting on you to give them the information for them to do it and you know a lot of people and including myself I'm a last minute Lucy Mm -hmm. and um, (laughs) and, you know my husband supports me in the business and when we first started he would be you didn't give me enough time you never tell me what's going on and and that's what a lot of our leaders are like they're just like yeah "Yeah, let's do it yeah yeah flying by the seat of their pants as uh, my mother would like to say (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, Shirley, now I'd like to move into this rich discussion about personality and how our individual personalities affect how well we lead. So what 
what do we, what is meant by our personality? Let's start there perhaps. Mm -hmm. it's, your personality starts from the get go. So I don't have children myself, but if you have a look at children, little babies, when they're born and into a family, they each have their own little different personality. They've got their own little package, even though the same ingredients went into that package. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> and that out they come and they're different but your personality is your habitual way of thinking feeling and behaving okay habitual way of thinking feeling and behaving okay got it mm -hmm. yeah so it's the way that you naturally do things it's the way that and, you're comfortable and you tend to do that in probably many different areas of your life and, mm -hmm. Yes. So you might yes. have a way of thinking professionally that you apply in your personal life and it might be too much. In fact, I remember dating a Swiss guy who was in the Swiss army and he was like, um, I don't know, very high up, whatever ranking that would be. And one time we were having a disagreement. Let's call it a fight. It's probably a fight. And, you know, just just words, though. <laughs> um, he was very civilized, more than me. And he realized that he was applying his military approach to our conversation and it wasn't working so well for me. <laughs> I mean, I like the color green. I just don't like wearing it as a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly. So it was really cool that he realized, you know, oh, because what would happen with this, when you're in the Swiss army, you're in a, at, as a reserve and you a couple times a year, you go for three weeks at a time and you serve your uh you you perform your service and so it was when he had come back so he had that mindset really uh well oiled and so he was able to make that connection i wonder if that's part of what you're talking about yes well there's a there's a very old saying how we do anything is how we do everything <laughs> And, and I really got this one time. We were over in America and we went to um, Disneyland and um, we had a go at Richard Petty's uh, NASCARs. And as we got in, it was, we were separate. And so for us, we were driving on the left-hand side and we'd go around this track and they had a pace car in front of you. And the guy said, when it's green, you can go. And when it's red, you're going too fast. You've got to slow down. So we had eight laps each and I thought that the car in front was my husband and I'm just waiting, waiting for it to go. And then suddenly I realized, hang on, that's the pace car. That's a green light. That's a go. And I put my foot down and took off. Well, when we finished, the guy, his name was Randy. He came over and he said, what happened? He said, you were driving like a lady on an old lady on a Sunday. He said, and then suddenly it took off and I went, mm-hmm yep that's how I do everything it takes me a while to get going and then once I go I go <laughs> oh that's fascinating so so then like what does personality have to do specifically with leadership and why is that important for us to know our personality type yes well we have a particular profile that we use called the reach profile and that looks at um, our relational drive and our achievement drive, which is how you get the REACH, RE and the ACH. And it's like most personality profiles, it's broken up into four quadrants. So we have a counsellor, a coach, an advisor, and a driver. These and are the four last... personality types. Mm -hmm. Counsellor, yep. advisor, coach, and? Driver. Driver, okay. Yeah, I should say driver, <laughs> not driver. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll ask you two questions, Amy, and we'll see, you know, okay. these are just rough, roughies, but it'll, it'll give us an idea. So when it comes to your day-to-day -day operations and tasks, what would you rather focus on, people or tasks? People. <laughs> Can you finish that question. That one? <laughs> people, 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 people. <laughs> and, and then when it comes to achieving your goals, do you like to sit down, think about them, research? search plan for them or do you prefer to just go with it yes get on with it get it over with yes <laughs> yes okay so that puts you in the coach quadrant oh that's because, convenient <laughs> yes <laughs> very <laughs> and we so it, it's like a, a matrix there and um on a on a scale like from naught to a hundred hundred at the top and um and naught at the bottom the bottom people the advisors and the drivers they focus more on tasks 
And then at the top, your coaches and your counsellors, they focus more on people. And then the thing that separates that out into left and right is how you achieve your goals. And so that, that personality is important when you're leading people because you're naturally going to do things your way. Right. And yet there's three other profiles that do things very differently to mm. you. Okay. Frustration, judgments. Uh, why won't these people do this? I just want them to do that. And, mm. you know, come on, I've made this decision. Let's go. And then the people are saying, God, you know, it, everything's haphazard. They're always coming and saying, here's the next thing. And why can't they just sit down and have a plan? And why don't they tell me anything? And so this is why it's really important to understand your own personality and then to understand the people's personality that you're working with. I like to say it's like learning another language. So if mm -hmm. you're going to, um, you said, I think it was the French, uh, when you went to Switzerland, you want to go to a French speaking company, was it? So I live in Switzerland and then I'm in the living in the French part um, and and they have a German section and Italian and a fourth one, Romanesque. Yes. So what was, say it again. Okay. Well, that's perfect. Okay. So you've got a French, you've got a German and you've got an Italian. Part yes. in Switzerland. Yep. And then uh, your Native American. A very. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, so, uh, Native American refers to um, First Nation people. So I would say I'm of, how would I say? I guess I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm originally from the US, is how I would say I'm American. I wouldn't add the Native American. Small detail for some uh, conversations, though, that's an important distinction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. I get that certainly. And um, yeah, pardon me for for that. No, no, you couldn't have known. The um, so so when you when you go into the quarters there, for example, if you go into the French quarter, then I'm imagining that you would be speaking some of their language and observing some of their culture. Then when you went into the German part, you would do the same and then into the Italian. And, and you would prepare yourself a little bit for that and think, all right, I need to know a few words. How do I get here? Yes, please. Thank you, etc. It's no different with our personalities. The other people is like another country. And you're not going to change being coming from America. That's not going to change. And the way that you do things is not going to change your personality. However, the way that you interact, and this is what you teach as well, is around that communication. The way that you're interacting is you start learning their language. So a coach, for example, loves the people and loves action. And the diametrically opposite to that is the advisor. They don't want any emotion of it. They want very formal. They want lots of information. They want to know the how. They're what we call our risk mitigators. So mm -hmm. you can imagine if you're a coach as a leader and you come in and you go, oh, I've seen this greatest next technology. Let's implement it. Let's get going next week. And then you haven't addressed the advisor who needs to know all of the tech specs. They, they, how are we going to do this? Who's going to do this? What's going to happen? What route have you done? You've got to actually prove it to them. So it's really important. Otherwise, you're going to have this real, mm, I don't know, angst in the workplace yeah. purely because we're not understanding our people and not speaking their language. Wow. that And I've all, often heard this um, and I... I feel very lucky with the women on my team because they have diff different styles that are opposite of mine, which is critical for a business to be successful. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You don't want all the same. Like imagine if we had all of the drivers and they're task focused and action and they, their key word is what, you know, what's our outcome? What are we doing this for? And they can be quite, they can appear quite abrupt. And, and they're not necessarily interested in what they would call the fluffy side of things. Right. Imagine if we had an organisation full of them, you know, they're all barking orders, all want to control, <laughs> and there would be no supporters there to be doing the work and looking after them. So, yeah, absolutely agree with you. You need all of them. Yeah, and when in that expression, you, too much of a good thing is too much. So you can go into each quadrant and say too much of this is too much. Um, so then... Uh, I'm wondering if you have some examples of stories, clients you've worked with where there's been this significant imbalance and what have you done to help them recalibrate or was there a different approach? 
Yes, no, no, absolutely. So I worked with one company and the management team were mostly advisors. And the advisors keyword is how. And remember, they're formal and they want to know all of the details before they'll get into action. So they come up with a, a new plan for how the company's going to work and what they're going to do. And then when you talk to the team, they're critical of management because they say, you can't get anything done around here. They come up with these ideas, but they never put them into action. We never seem to implement that. We never seem to go forward. And of course, the, the advisors, the management team, they're like, oh, shock horror, because we've got to make it right. We've got to get it perfect before we can even start, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then on the other side, we have some drivers and their keyword is what? What's the outcome that we're going to achieve? Task, task, task. And for them, they actually have to make a task of spending time with people. It's just right. not their natural way. Right. So that's how they get around it. But, but after a while, it, that just burns people out because they feel like you're not interested in them. You're not asking them how's their kids, how's their grandmother, how's their dog, how was their weekend? And in fact, I had yeah. one late lady who owns a marketing business, and this is just classic. She was talking to me this day, and she said, oh, God, Jill. she said, I, I have this person, and she comes in. She said, I've got to spend half an hour with her every morning. How are you going? How's this? What's this? What's going on? She said, and if that's not enough, then at the end of the day, I've got to go, how was your day? And how is this? She said, I just wanted to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's a driver so you know the counselor right. doesn't feel very loved or supported or appreciated right so um in elite these particularly small businesses that have limited number of people um what kind of then I, I, maybe you said it and i missed it though how do you get them to re rebalance that well, you don't rebalance it because okay. people aren't going to change. It's right. Like, you know, you're, you're not going to mix up the Italian, the German and the French in Switzerland. Right. But what you'll do is you'll adopt when you're in the German quarter, you'll adopt. Okay, the that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you're in the French, you'll adopt that way or in the Italian. So, so you adapt. And that's really what the reach is. We like we get this circle around your personality and it's the agility to which you can adapt mm -hmm. to the other profile. Mm. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give... That's a great, that word agility is so important, you know, because change is a constant. We have to be willing to be adaptable, flexible and agile. So um, it may not be easier, comfortable or natural and it may be essential for future success. Yes. Okay, you yes. were going to give okay. an example. Yes. Uh, so as I said, I work with a lot of real estate agents and they're predominantly salespeople. The best salespeople have the biggest reach because when they're sitting in the lounge room, they sum up pretty quickly what the personality is of the person that they're talking to. And for the advisor, they give them all of the detail. This is how we're going to sell your house. This is when this meeting's happening. This is when this is going to happen. If they're in the house with a counsellor, they're sitting down, they're having a cup of tea, they're spending 5, 10, 15 minutes chatting with the person, even though they might be looking at their watch, they're, they're there with their with a coach they're developing rapport they're having fun they're talking emotional uh, um, topics and then if they're in the house with a driver the driver just wants to know what's the outcome how much is it going to cost me when can we get this done and okay where do I sign okay it's really helping now the analogy with the language and um, learning that and, and then adapting to your audience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I get it now um, so I'm curious to, uh, I'm not sure where I want to take this next. I, I wonder if you want to expand more on the personality aspect. Um, now that we've understood the types, I guess my next question is what makes a great leader? And maybe yeah, explain I, that about the adapting. Well, I love the quote by John Maxwell. And he said, um, leadership is, is about becoming the type of person that others trust to take them where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, and the them is where the leader wants to go or where the other people want to go. 
where the other people want to go. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So say the so quote he, again. So we we're we make sure. <laughs> yeah. It's about becoming the type of person who others trust to take them where they want to go. Okay. And we're going to pause here. I'm going to mm-hmm. have a break. And then when we come back, we'll pick it up from there. Listeners, if you want to connect, find out more about Shirley, you can go directly to her website, ShirleyDalton.com. And let me spell that for you. S-H-I-R-L-E-Y-D-A-L-T-O-N. And if you're ready to take your superhero partner powers into the next decade, join me for my online leadership presence courses. You can find out more about those on my website, carolcoaching.com. When we come back from the break, we'll be hearing more from Shirley. So stay tuned. You're listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Welcome back. My guest today is Shirley Dalton, and we've been discussing how our personality affects how well we lead and what we can do to be more adaptable and be better leaders. So Shirley, you had a great quote just before the break. So let's hear that one again and continue on. Yes, by John Maxwell. And he says, leadership is about becoming the type of person others trust to take them where they want to go. Brilliant. Yeah. So if I can expand on that, we use a boat model. So imagine a sailing boat and um, the the captain says, we're going to Antarctica. And somebody goes, I don't want to go to Antarctica. And somebody else says, well, well, I'm taking this boat to the Caribbean. Oh, yes, please. I'm on that boat. So what we've got to understand as leaders is that people get on your boat for their reasons, not yours. You know, a lot of leaders think, oh, people are just after a job. They're actually not. And, and we dig into this. There's a lot of reasons. It could be for the pay. It could be for the training. It could be for the destination. It could be because they like the leader. It could be because their friends are there. Like there's any number of reasons why people are on your boat or in your organisation. And as a leader, if you can find out and help them to get what they want, in exchange, you'll get what you want. And, you know, and it's, it's a really simple, but such a, a profound way of thinking about people yeah. because now you're looking to see, wow, why are they on my boat? Okay. Yeah. Let's go there. How do you get that information? <laughs> Just by asking people, you know, what's of interest to you. I, mm. When I was working in the franchise organization, um, the boss that I had, Kip McGrath, he was just amazing, amazing guy. And he worked me out pretty quick, smart. He worked out, I was in my um, mid thirties and he said, um, I'll give, I, I really like what you're doing. You can make a decision, you know, all these things. He said, um, I will give you three years of management training if you'll give me five years of service. And I thought, he's a smart man because he figured me out because he knew I was ambitious. I wanted to grow. And so, yep, he gave me the three years and there was pay rises along the way as well. Mm -hmm. And he kept me there for five years, you know, and and it was a handshake, no agreement, just a handshake. That's a fantastic example. Um, So good on him for sussing you out like that and for offering something that was realistic and feasible that you were willing to commit to. And it removed that element of uncertainty or you're, you know, you're always looking elsewhere, perhaps no, because you knew I've got five years here, I'm staying committed uh, and you're a person of integrity. So you, you know, that's something you were prepared to honor and he knew, okay, I'm going to get the best I can from Shirley for five years. And then I'm going to have to say goodbye. It's going to be very sad and I'm not going to want to do it. And it's what we agreed to. <laughs> yeah, and I'm still in touch with him, you know, 16 years later. So actually, if I'd been there now, it would have been 21 years we would have known each other. Yeah. Shirley, let, let me ask you about this. There's a book that I know of you may have heard called The Tao of Coaching, T-A-O. I'm always baffled by how it gets pronounced, the Tao. Though. <laughs> and in the back of that book, there is a two-page questionnaire on uh, discovering people's motivation. Okay. And I wonder if that's a great tool that leaders can use to help answer some of these questions. Because uh, if the person doesn't know themselves well, 
and the leader doesn't know what questions to ask. Uh, so, so do you have specific questions that, or something that you help leaders to use as a guide? Uh, yes. Um, apart from asking questions, the, the most important skill that you can ever have, in my opinion, is the ability to, to listen. And, and we're not just listening with our ears, we're, we're listening with our eyes, with our, yeah. our body. So and um, a lot of people miss that. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, our leadership experience, I spend a whole day teaching people how to actively listen. And the first exercise I, I give them is to talk about something boring, like what did you do before you came to the course today or what did you do last night? And they have to give this, and I give them two minutes to talk. So yeah. that stumps them, of course, you know, oh, God, what am I going to talk about for two minutes? And the other person has to just be quiet and not say anything, just use what we call minimal um, attendance and encourages. They can't do it, Amy. <laughs> they start interrupting. They start talking about themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, my son loves soccer. And oh, yeah, I was there. And I'm going, shush, shush. That's, that's all you have to do is be quiet. And in fact, Peter Drucker says in, in one of his books there, um, <laughs> listening's not a skill. Anybody can do it. All you have to do is shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's the shutting up part that's the skill. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I do think it is a skill. I think it's one of the hardest skills that you can learn because you actually have to apply yourself and you have to really be present with the people. Yeah, and most people aren't. So let's go off on that tangent for a minute because this is a big passion for myself as well. And when I'm coaching people, I have two ways to support them. One is a video I made called active listening and I attach it with active interruption because sometimes that's an important skill. I explain, don't overuse that skill only when you really have to. Though the active listening is um, what stumps them is I have them do the exercise. I say, okay, so the person's going to listen. And after you interrupt them, you're going to summarize what you heard, something you heard them say. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, just something. And lo and behold, surely they're, they say, you know, if I'm interrupting, it's surely, if I understood correctly, and then there's silence. And they look and they, and they say, Amy, I, I don't know what she said. I wasn't listening. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. You know, you, so as a result, that is one of the skills that yeah, I make them go away and practice, actually listen to them so that when you do interrupt or when they're finished speaking, you summarize, that's the little quiz. So that gets their brain having to pay attention. Then there's this other thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, it I always get, I have an article. If listeners want it, I can send it to you um, to teach you something called, um, I, I call it mirror listening. And so the way it would, it's, it works well for people who realize that when someone else is speaking, their brain is off thinking about their response or it triggers another thought. So to get people to stay focused, as you're speaking, Shirley, in my brain, I would be repeating what you're saying verbatim. So let's just practice it for a minute. This is going to be weird for listeners to hear, though. They're going to hear my voice just slightly, well, with Zoom, who knows if it's going to work. So Shirley, give me three to five sentences and just keep talking as if I'm not saying anything. Okay, so one of the things that I really love about your work is when you're talking about predator, prey, and partner. When you're a partner, you're actually speaking the other person's language. You're actually doing what we talk about with leadership, and that is to um, have people trust you to take them where they want to go. Okay, all right, so now that may have been distracting for you. And listeners, that's not the exercise. You're not supposed to actually talk at the same time. I'm just illustrating that that I was saying probably 95 percent of the words Shirley was saying a few seconds after her so what this is doing is it's forcing our brains to stay focused on exactly precisely what the other person is saying and then when I ver you know repeat it back to her I might do a summary oh so Shirley what I just heard you say is that you made the connection between the model of predator prey partner and the importance of adapting yourself as a leader. Mm -hmm. you know, and then I would check, yes. Okay. So listeners, if you're guilty, as many of us are, of being distracted and thinking about other things, and you want to train your brain to do this habit that's very simple. Next time someone starts talking, you just 
keep your lips closed and track them verbatim what they're saying and then summarize. Do you know, Amy, I love that because what we know is that we think at around about 450 to 500 words a minute and um, we speak at around about 120 to 140. So if somebody's speaking, you know, and sometimes you get someone who's a really slow talker. (laughs) So you've got all of that excess capacity. So to fill it in by doing that exercise that you just uh, taught us, that is brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I, I when I came across it, I was delighted. Okay, so Shirley, let's jump back to what you said a minute ago when we were doing the demo. Um, for listeners who are not familiar with this model of predator prey partner, let me take a few minutes to give them an overview. So this model is a communication model that my sister Pat Kirkland developed, and the three archetypes, as Shirley mentioned, are predator prey partner. So the predator. Oh no, let me back up some more. Most of us, most of the time, are behaving as partners. Like you and I right now, Shirley, we're both holding high respect for ourselves and each other all as well. The problem is under pressure, stress, perceived threat, crisis, COVID, or just if we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we can slip into one extreme or the other, the predator or the prey. Many of us can flip-flop. Some of us are dedicated to just one style. (laughs) And... The predator holds too much respect for herself. So if you and I, if there is a stress moment, I might say, Shirley, but Shirley, would you just, I get it. Could I? You know, and all of a sudden I'm putting the hand up and I got an attitude. I'm saying, but and I'm sounding aggressive. And then that could damage the relationship. Now, alternatively, if Shirley and I, or something happens, I'm feeling under stress and I go pray, that, but, but Shirley, I, I, I know, I know. I, I, I'm so sorry, Shirley. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could I just explain? And now I'm in kind of begging energy. And listeners, the reason that's, I would say, dangerous is because even someone as nice and easygoing as Shirley on her Friday afternoon in the trailer park might still could trigger her to go predator on me. So that's the explanation very high level of the predator prey partner and when i work with people i help them focus on their body language voice words and mindset in order to stay partner under pressure so they don't damage relationships so they don't get mistreated okay so surely um now let's pick it up from there what you were saying was when i was really talking over you <laughs> was you, you saw you see the connection Yeah, absolutely. And I love the story that you tell uh, in your book, or I was listening to your um, YouTube as well, where you went and you'd lost your passport. And you gave some great examples of how you could have been that passive aggressive or actually aggressive and, uh, and talk to this person like what's what, um, or you could have been in the prey, prey, prey. And in the end, you got what you wanted. And I think that's a great example there where when, when you can understand other people, then, then you can speak their language. You, you soon realize if I act in this way, it's not going to get me what I want. Right. And, and you know, and people can say, oh, that's manipulative. It is in yes. a way, but manipulation is not a bad word, you know. I know. Um, <laughs> because we're influencing people. Right. So here's why I don't feel guilty about it being manipulative. And yes, as like you do, I agree. It is manipulating. The thing is, I'm manipulating myself mm-hmm. with the hopes that it might have a positive in- impact on the other person. And I'm forcing myself to do to stay detached from the outcome, which means if it doesn't have the impact I'm hoping for, my job is to stay respectful partner anyway. Now, I want to back up and say something. You said, Shirley, if, pe- if we can understand people better, well, you might be thinking, oh, I have to understand each individual person. For me, the, the beauty of the predator prey partner model is in the simplicity. We make an assumption tell me what you think about this, that all human beings want to feel safe and respected. I would generally agree with that. Right? Um, And so that's the premise of partner. My job is to hold high respect for myself and high respect for the other, regardless of what's happening. 
even if they're misbehaving, being difficult, having a bad hair day, as we say in New York. And, <laughs> and it, that takes the training and the discipline and the challenge because I want to take it personally if they're being rude to me. I, um, that then causes me to want to have one of these alternative reactions. And then that is what causes it all to, as my mother said, when the, you know, the shit hits the fan. (laughs) (laughs) I like your mother. (laughs) Yeah. She says it as she sees it. So, um, that for me is, um, it makes it perhaps a little simpler than, knowing different personality types. So yours, there's another layer of necessity for us to take into consideration. Would you, does that make sense to you? Do you agree with that or you see it differently? Yeah, no, I think they they all uh, complement each other. And I mean, you can go down even further and further with the personalities. You know, there's another 10 distinctions that makes you uniquely you as well. Um, And we would do a personality profile to get that as well. But I I love the model because when you're looking in in the partner, we have uh, the assertiveness model, which the definition of assertive is I get my needs met and a big word there and not at your expense yep and so so we have like this pendulum on the one side would be like the prey which is the passive you know and 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 what that means is I lose and you win and then on the other side we have passive aggressive or aggressive which means I win and you lose and most people will sit on either side and they don't get that the um, assertiveness is actually in the middle which is the true win-win yeah and And in order to do that, you have to be congruent. You have to be aware of your needs. You have to take responsibility for your needs. And then then you use all of your communication skills, which is a lot of what you teach. But first, we've got to have that understanding that, you know, it's a win-win. And and I've got to understand what I want, be aware of it, take responsibility for it, and then use my skills. So, Shirley, I'm going to make a confession. I am going to be having a conversation with someone very important to me. And it's about um, a, a, we have a disagreement about something. And we said at at the time when it happened, we both agreed, okay, let's not talk about it right now. We were both too heated. Let's find another time we can talk about it. So we said, you know, we're gonna talk about it in a couple of weeks. And so I've been preparing for this conversation though surely my little ego has been going, you know, this, I did this right and this right and this right and this right, and you did this wrong and this right. So I am totally setting up a win lose scenario because my ego wants to be right. And so I caught this <laughs> couple of obsession, obsessional conversations ago, monologues, and realized, oh, Amy, this person is too important for you. You, it, you know, it's time to upgrade. You, that is going to end in disaster. You no 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 you cannot go into that conversation like that. Um, so I, the things I've been saying is, I, I heard I think it was from um, I interviewed someone a while ago who had a fantastic um, description. He said, "Go into a conversation with the intention to prove yourself wrong." I love it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm there yet, though. <laughs> That's so I'm saying this out loud to you and to listeners to as a commitment to myself of so before I have a conversation with that person, I want to see if I can make myself wrong, legitimately reasonably wrong from their pers- the other person's perspective. Um, and and with that is to go with a gentler approach for my ego is to go into that conversation um, as I want to understand from them. Mm-hmm. Though, you know, I, I'm so I'm, I'm not convinced that I'm really ready to take on this challenge in a whole new way. And I'm also thinking about confessing to this person <laughs> that um, I, I really want to I've been spending a, hours uh, plotting my winning strategy and and making me right, making you wrong, almost as a way to. I don't want to not to disarm the other person, though, to hold myself to a higher level of accountability. 
So like, you know, this is my confession. This is where I'm getting it wrong. This is ideally what I want to be. Can you help me <laughs> to be in that space of, I want to understand and I want to legitimately agree where, you know, where I could have been done things differently or done things better. Okay. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that's great because what you're doing is using your communication skills and using your training. So years ago, I trained as a lifeline telephone counselor. And Me too. We, <laughs> and, and we weren't allowed to solve their problems. We, could, we couldn't be in front pulling them in the direction we wanted to go. We couldn't be behind them pushing. We had to be beside them and, and just supporting them. And what I learned from that is that if you care about the relationship, use your skills, use your communication skills. And if you don't, you know, I don't know whether you take them off or put the gloves on, but anyway, have a go. And, um, and what I learned with Lifeline was when I'd go into the organisation, everybody had the skills and they would all use them. And it, was, it just was so lovely. Like there was conflict for sure. Yeah. But we had a nice way of dealing with it. Then you'd walk out, walk down the street or into the shopping centre and you'd hear people at, at, at each other and I'd cringe and I'd go, oh, yeah. there's a better way. And, yeah. I, and I think that's something that you and I have in common there is that having these communication skills and then sharing them with other people because at the end of it, I think all we truly want is for people to have what they want. In fact, my mission in life is to inspire, educate and support you to be, do, have and feel what you want. And, and that's really that's my agenda is to help you get what you want. Yeah. And surely one thing, maybe we can invite listeners to upgrade even more. So those, they're the relationships we care about and we want to invest in and the relationships we don't care about or those superficial exchanges. I always encourage people to use those as your science laboratory to practice the skills of partner and know that maybe you'll get it wrong sometimes. Though when yes. you get it wrong, whether it's the important relationship or the superficial one, to step back and analyze and say, okay, what did I do that did work well? And what can I do even better next time? Um, so that we're always offering ourselves the opportunity to, as I like to say, go to the partner gym. <laughs> yes, yes. Excellent. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Good. So Shirley, um, as we're starting to wrap up today, I'd like to invite you to offer one call for action to our listeners. It might be something you've already shared because I know you're gonna, we're gonna talk about some things that you're, we're, you're gonna be able to offer to listeners. So what is one call for action that you would invite them to consider? The next time that they're in a conversation with someone, and I'd really invite them to just put themselves to the side and to get present and to just focus on the person and really be there and listen to them and then have an attempt to demonstrate. And that's what active listening is. It's demonstrating that I heard and understood the message. And it doesn't matter if you get it wrong because people will either confirm it or clarify. They'll say, yeah, yeah, that's yes. right or, or no, that's not. But the, but the yeah. person that you're doing it for is them. So that's one action is to really listen because then when you listen, you get to know the people and then you'll know how to work with them and speak their language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful. And listeners, my call for action for you is um, there, there are some books that we talked about, The Tao of Coaching, spelled T-A-O. That's a very thin, tiny book with a rich communication model that can be applied for people who are not trained as coaches, not a communication model, a coaching model, um, a coaching approach. So if you're a leader, a manager, or a parent, and you want to practice improving your communication, no, let me say it again, your coaching skills, this is a really user-friendly model that you can apply immediately. Plus, it's got those two pages of questions in the back for uh, motivational, what motivates people to learn more about others. And there was another book uh, when we're talking about personality type and working on the business versus in the business, um, The E-Myth Revisited. And do you remember his, the author's name, Shirley? Yeah, Michael Gerber. Michael Gerber. B -E -R. Mm -hmm. So that's a great book I read years ago. And now that you've brought it up, I feel like mm, maybe I need to revisit that book. 
Um, so that's, yeah, that's a very rich book for business leaders. And the other call for action I have for our listeners is to feel free to send me your communication conundrums, clashes, challenges, mishaps, and blunders, plus your successes. And you can do this via email or social media because my social media partner in crime, Talitha V and I will be jumping in. Um, in fact, next week, we're gonna have an episode talking about how to stay partner and how it can bring peace and positive results in pretty much any situation. So listeners, if you send me your challenges, your questions, your successes, we can use these on future episodes to help other people learn and discover from them. Now, if you want to connect with Shirley, and I highly recommend you do, her website again is shirleydalton.com, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y-D-A-L-T-O-N. And Shirley, do you have um, another way you'd also like them to connect with you? Yes. If they like to go to the website, shirleydalton.com forward slash reach um, for your listeners, they can have a complimentary reach profile and um, and depending on how many there are, because I don't want to overcommit myself. Um, so let's say the first 10, if there is 10, can have a debrief with me on it. And this is the aha session, right? And you don't do a sales pitch, which is important for people to know that that's really just a very generous offer you're making. Yes, yes. Yep. Wonderful. So, yeah, I, it's just it's something that I love to do, Amy. I just love people and I love people to get what they want and to have great relationships. And I think that's that's my little contribution to to others. Wonderful. And listeners, uh, feel free to check out my website for more information, whether it's on the predator prey partner model or anything else about the communication videos that you want to learn about. That's at carolcoaching.com or feel free to connect with me on social media channels, Amy Carol Coaching. And if you're game for more, I'm going to be hopping over to Facebook Live five minutes past the hour for a short chat on today's call. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. This has been a wonderful conversation. That's a pleasure, Amy. I've really enjoyed it. And I've learned so much as well. Thank you. Wonderful. And listeners, thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Happy partnering, everyone. 